Learning exactly how computers work internally is a monumental task. It can take a huge effort to scale the mountain. But the view from the peak is pretty breathtaking. Our modern CPUs and GPUs are some of the most complex machines that mankind's devised. In this video series, I'm trying to take one of the seminal pieces of work in the area, Alan Turing's 1936 paper where he introduced the concept of a Turing machine, and recasting these ideas in terms of simple arithmetic and the 6502 microprocessor. Hopefully this will help the hike up the mountain. For the rule book, I wanted a wide data bus so I could simultaneously output the next rule, the right symbol and the direction at the same time, so I coupled the EEPROMs together to form a 24-bit output memory. For the notebook on the other hand, I just need a single large address space. I've made it 8 bits wide here, but I only actually need it to be 2 bits wide. I'm going to use a combination of static RAM and an EEPROM. This means I can read and write to it, but I don't have to preload it every time I want to use it. We can think of this as being a 1 meg by 2 bit memory space. I'll start by adding these chips to the schematic. I'll connect up all the corresponding address lines, and by that I mean connect A0 to A0, A1 to A1, and so forth. In this case I'm going to call them NA0 and NA1, and the reason for doing that is to differentiate them from the address lines going into the big EEPROMs in the rulebook. The footprint for the two chips is different, so I'm just going to need to move these over a little bit and fill in the gap. As usual, I start by laying down the chips and connecting up the power signals. I'm replaying this build a lot faster than I have previous builds. This is 12 times real time, and I've cut out the static frames where my hand is not in the picture. Let me know what you think in the comments. Do you prefer this method, or do you prefer it a bit slower where you can see each wire more easily? Just as I did with the rulebook EEPROMs, I'm keeping the address lines on the right hand side of the chip tucked in close. And that's because the driving signals for these address lines are going to come from the right hand side of the board that I haven't developed yet. Alright, that's that done. In the code, I have a notepad pointer, which is an integer, and this is the main index into the notepad array. Once I'm done with the read, modify, write on the notepad, I update the value by adding one if I want to move to the right and subtracting one if I want to move to the left. I'll look at an 8-bit example first. If I want to move right, I add one binary. But if I want to move left, the number that I add contains all ones. For this build, I'm going to use the 74HC283, which is a 4-bit adder. It has an A input, a B input, and a sum output. The sum output simply reflects the value of A plus B plus carry in. And by chaining the carries on two chips, we can form an 8-bit adder. Now I need an octal D-type flip-flop to store the output of this 8-bit adder. Now this value stored is actually our notepad pointer. This feeds back into one of the inputs on the adder. And on the other input, I want the value of 1 or minus 1. In both cases, the value of B0 is kept high, and all the other B inputs are tied together and connected to the left-right bar signal. For this particular build, I actually need the notepad pointer to be 20 bits wide. And I'll go over the reason for this in the next video. But for now, I just want to build the first 8 bits. First of all, I need to lay down two 74HC283s. This forms my 8-bit adder. Connect power and ground. For the Octal D-Type flip-flop, I'm going to use the 74HC273. And I'm going to use this chip because it has an asynchronous reset input. If we go back to the code, we can see that I want to set the notepad pointer to be zero. So I can do this with the reset line when I start the machine. I connect the output from this flip-flop back up to what input of the adders. So technically, this is also a finite state automata. The longer you do computer architecture, the more and more you run into these. I'm going to tie the B0 input high through a resistor. And for all the other inputs, I'm going to connect them together and tie them to the right bar signal. I've left this space above the memory chips to form the first 8 bits of our adder. The reason I chose this location is that A0 through A7 is located on the left hand side of the memory chips. So I just need to tap into that bus that's already there. The adder at the upper left is for the lower four bits. Unfortunately, the pinout for the 74HC283 is a bit convoluted. 
So a number of these signals are going to have to cross the midline. As much as I can, I try to keep the wires either horizontal or vertical. This avoids the need to bend them, but sometimes it's just not possible. So now I'm connecting up the upper four bits of the adder. Ideally, I actually would have liked to have put this chip above the other two chips on the upper left, but there just wasn't enough space. I need to set the lowest carry to ground, and then carry out from one chip goes to carry in of the other. Now here's the cool thing with schematic capture. I can just copy and paste that entire 8-bit adder to form a 16-bit adder. I need to connect through the cascading carry line, relabel all of the address lines to be NA8 through NA15, which in turn are connected to the appropriate lines on the memory chips. Here's a logic chip, which I'll come back to later. Now I'm going to lay down the next 8 bits of my up-down counter. Note that this time I was actually able to put the two adders directly above the 8-bit octal D-type flip-flops. Most of the address lines that this up-down counter uses are on the right-hand side of the chip, so this is really conveniently located. I haven't shown this in the build, but before I start, I generally loosely lay down the chips just to get an idea of where all the wires are going to go. This little bit of planning can make a huge difference to the build. I want to keep as many wires just running horizontally and vertically. I want to minimize the number of bends I have in the wire. Ooh, I made an error there. At least I caught it. Back to the wires. If I do have to have a bend, I want to limit it to just one or two. Convoluted wires with multiple bends in them are just a nightmare. We're making good progress with this second set of 8 bits for the up-down counter. Fortunately, only two of the address lines are on the left-hand side of the memory chips. We're getting close. Only another four bits to go. Hopefully it's pretty obvious by now how I'm going to do that. I copy one of the 8-bit adders, paste it, remove one of the 74HC283s, then rename the remaining address bits NA16 through NA19. Connect up the right bar signal which is also my left right bar signal. Technically, I'm probably exceeding the fan out limit for TTL logic, but I'm not going to be clocking it that aggressively, so we'll see if it works. Connect up the D-type flip-flop and the adder. Unfortunately, this isn't the greatest location for this circuit. Three of the address lines need to go back to the chips themselves, so this is going to be a little bit convoluted. NA19, on the other hand, goes to the logic chip, so that'll be a bit easier. Now, for the most part, we have our rule book and our notepad wired up. Some of you who are familiar with the 7400 series might know that I could have used an up-down counter like the 74HC193. I did, in fact, use this chip in another build. And ultimately, there are pros and cons to each approach. We're actually getting pretty close to having a working machine. We just need to coordinate the whole thing with a clock signal. The clock is just a square wave that oscillates at a particular frequency. For this machine, I'm going to get an Arduino to generate the clock signal. As soon as the clock goes low, I want to do the notepad read, followed by the rulebook lookup. This is the equivalent of doing this notepad read, followed by these three rulebook lookups. The values get latched into the flip-flops on the positive edge of clock. Once clock is high, we write the new symbol over the old symbol on the notepad. We also want to wait for the output values on the adder to settle. This is analogous to doing this right, and this add. On the negative edge of clock, we latch the value into the notepad pointer. We do this so that the value notepad pointer is the same for the read and the write. Now that we have these two pieces assembled, we can start to build a block diagram for the entire machine. We have the finite state automata, which is the rule book. We can add the up-down counter, which, when combined with a memory, forms a sequential access bidirectional memory that Turing spoke about. Of course, he just called it a tape. Now we need to focus on how symbols are passed around. The first thing we need to do is hook up the notepad and the rule book. Remember that when clock's low, we want to read from the notepad and use this as an index into the rule book. This means we want the data coming out of the notepad to go into the address lines of the rule book. We hit a problem though when we try and hook up the right symbol pathway. The output from the flip-flops is always driving these signals. So when clock's low, we're going to get contention between these flip-flops and the output from the notepad memory. This is bad, 
and might let the smoke out of the chips. To solve this problem, I'm going to introduce the tri-state buffer. It has an input and an output, but it also has an enable signal. When enable's low, the input value is just reflected on the output. But when the enable signal is high, it doesn't matter what's on the input. The output's in this state called high impedance, which I've represented here as high Z. This means that the output is disconnected from the buffer and the wires are just floating. This is also called a tri-state buffer, and this allows other devices to drive a bus that might be connected. The 74HC244 contains eight of these buffers, but it's grouped into two sets of four, where each group of four has an independent enable line. I'm going to add two buffers to the right symbol pathway, although we just generally draw it as a single buffer. But there are two there because there are two wires in the bus. What happens now when clock's low and we're reading from the notepad is that the write symbol is blocked by this buffer and the notepad is the only device talking to this symbol bus. Now, when clock's high and we want to write to the notepad, the buffer will be enabled and this allows the signal to go from the output flip-flops into the notepad. This signal will actually also travel back into the rule book, but we don't use the rule book while clock's high, so this doesn't matter. I did actually put another set of buffers in the build to stop the signal going back to the rule book, but this is actually unnecessary. This is our final block diagram for the machine. Its beauty is its simplicity. Remember in the last video how I said we had 24 bits coming out of our rule book, but we only needed 17? For now, I'm just going to make these some spare outputs which I'm going to connect to the Arduino, and this just lets us monitor the progress of the circuit. The Arduino doesn't have enough pins to hook up to the address lines on the rule book, so we can't actually tell externally what rule we're in, but these extra signals can be used to signal to the external world what's going on. The Arduino generates our raw clock signal, but we also need an inverted clock, clock bar. We could use an inverter to generate this, but it means that there'll be a slight delay between the edges of clock and clock bar. This sometimes causes a problem, so to solve it, I'm going to introduce another gate, the exclusive OR gate. This has the properties that if the inputs are the same, the output's low, but if the inputs are different, the output's high. Now, I can connect up my raw clock signal up to two exclusive OR gates, one wired up as a buffer and the other wired up as an inverter, then both will be delayed relative to clock raw, but they'll be in phase with each other, which is what I want. The 74HC86 contains four exclusive OR gates. This was the extra logic chip that I laid down near my top 8 bit adder. I'm going to configure three as an inverter and one as a buffer. Next, I connect the clock raw signal up to an inverter and a buffer, generating clock and clock bar. This means they should transition at almost exactly the same time. I'm going to use the other two exclusive OR gates to generate a reset bar signal and to generate a static RAM output enable signal. I'll explain how this works in a bit more detail in the next video. For the rulebook Octal D type flip flops, I need to feed them clock and reset bar, while the notepad flip flops require clock bar and reset bar. It's probably worth looking at the full schematic diagram to see how the EEPROM and static RAM in the notepad are wired up. The trickiest signal is SRAM OE, and I'll go over that next video. I'm going to use four buffers inside the 74HC244 for connecting up the symbol bus. Two of them are for connecting up the output flip flops from the rulebook. The other two are for isolating the address lines going into the rulebook EEPROMs. I only need 64k of the EEPROMs, so I'm going to tie these upper address lines low. I'm connecting up a resistor network to the Arduino, but I don't really need this either. I'm going to scoot through the control lines pretty quickly here. It'll probably be pretty difficult to keep up with what I'm doing, but the idea is more just to give you an idea of the scope of the work. I've provided a link below to the GitHub repository for the schematic diagram for the build, and you'll probably get more value by studying that. All right, nearly done. I just need to wire in the Arduino, and then I should be ready to try it out. In summary, this is the block diagram for the overall build, and in the next video we'll work on the bring up. It still amazes me that this is all you require for a fully functional computer, albeit a slow one.
Please remember to like, share and subscribe and don't forget the notification bell.